Hi, I'm Ron. I'm the world's foremost authority. Just ask. He was the smartest guy at school. Ron is a unique person, if I may put it that way. The psychic said, how are you doing? And Ron looked at her and he said, I thought you'd tell us. And he tra travels to places that uh, people normally wouldn't go. I, I started traveling as a teenager and went to Europe after high school and went to, went to Israel, backpacking Europe and Israel and, and, and the like, and then came back. And during my student years, I really didn't have the means to travel. But so I've always done it, but the frequency has increased. I like to do new things and see different things. I don't like to keep going back to the same places. In Egypt, up the Nile and the pyramids, there was, oh, uh, probably 20 years between the first trip and the second trip. But the second trip to me seemed like a week later. I just did this. Some places are really good and you can go to again and again and again because they're so big and there's so much to see. China is one of them. I've been to China 15 times. I uh, haven't seen all of China yet, but I've seen most of China. I've been to Africa 10 times and haven't begun to see it all. But there's some places that I, uh, that I haven't been because there's really not much to see. Cities in Africa or nothing that you, that, that you want, want to visit. Because they're all new and they're all created in modern times by, in some cases, tens of millions of people crowding, piling into slums. The government is there, completely corrupt, stealing. The last place I would ever want to go is Lagos, Nigeria, which I don't know, was 10 million or 15 million or 20 million people. Horrible weather, meaning hot and humid, pollution and crime and traffic. Karachi, Pakistan is another urban hellhole of 25 million people with one exception. One, they have an important airport there, and two, excellent, excellent shopping and, and price, low, low prices because there are no tourists there. <laughs> Most of the people who go to India just see the same things in the, in, the, in the tourist triangle of Delhi and Agra and Jaipur, where, whereas next month I'll be going back to Nagaland, part, p place people have never heard of, uh, and then to Arunachal Pradesh where people have really never heard of. Uh, but it's all part of India. So when you start counting countries and going to different countries, the way to really cheat and rack up the numbers is to go island hopping in the Caribbean and the Pacific. Because there, you, if you're counting countries and counting flags, there you're going to get the most. Whereas China is a world into itself, Russia is one one-sixth of the Earth's surface, and that's all one country. Now, of course, the Soviet Union was even bigger. That was one country. Now you can at least you get about 15 countries out of the Soviet Union, if you're country counting. And then you have places like uh, the former Yugoslavia, which is now seven countries, or is it six countries? But anyway, I've been, I've been to them all. Most people go out of their way to be nice to foreigners, nice to travelers. Uh, with the exception of places like Paris and New York City. But if you're going on world champions of rudeness, I guess it'd be Israel, where there's uh, New Yorkers on steroids. <laughs> but uh, people are nice, pretty much but most nice everywhere. And even when they hate you, they're nice to you. For instance, in Egypt, where they hate Americans, they're very nice to, they're, they're very nice to you because they, they treat you as an individual. There are a lot of places, when I say they hate you, that's not true. America is hated in many parts of the world, but Americans are not. With one exception, it's kind of funny. North Korea, where the people are so brainwashed from, from day one, is about, about killing Americans and the songs they sing to uh, uh, the, the nursery school and they, they sing to calm their children. Nursery lullabies about let's kill the Americans. Um, they're not mean to you or anything. They're afraid of you. But that stands out as, as an exception. And North Korea is like the closest you can come to leaving the planet without a rocket ship. <laughs> I look for things that are unique to a place, that I like, that just appeal to me, that are transportable. <laughs> <laughs> and I buy regular souvenir type things, but not too many. I, I like stuff that's beautiful, that appeals to me, unique to a, cult, to a country or a culture, and that will remind me of my trip. For instance, right behind me and on top of me, we have here, that's 
Behind is, is, is a Tinga Tinga painting from Zanzibar. It's a very specific style and it's unique to Zanzibar. Uh, you can see it's cartoonish and simple. It's folk art. It's primitive, but it's good. Now, what you're looking at is a homemade art rest restoration because the people there, the artists, they use bed sheets for, cot, for canvas, old bed sheets for that matter, and they stretch them out on homemade stretchers, and then they don't have proper artist paint, they use car paint. And it looks great in the, in, in the gallery, in the shops, and you buy it, and they, they peel it off so you can get it home and roll it up and stick it in, and when you get it back, all the paint's cracked, <laughs> and it's not meant to be folded and rolled up. So I ended up just uh, gluing it to a giant piece of cardboard and getting it flat that way, and then using model paints and a little brush to, to replace the parts, the flakes of paint that have fallen away. And I think I did a pretty good job, if I do say so myself. <laughs> to the left of that, that I bought in Karachi. I think it's from Baluchistan. Uh, it's a tribal wedding dress from Pakistan. I bought it in Karachi. Um, but I think it's uh, from it's Baluchistan, which is a tr uh, province there. Uh, it's a wedding dress, and you can see from the dimensions, it's pretty much geared for your 15-year-old child bride who's skinny and undeveloped. <laughs> uh, you could just tell from it. And it's beautiful, handmade, uh, the elaborate work on it. And I'm um, guessing it's probably 50 or 60 years old. And I, I like it because, well, it's beautiful and I put it up and hang it on the wall and it reminds me of a trip and it's an artifact. Facing it is one I just brought back from Afghanistan. That's a wedding dress too. Uh, there I think they like their women a little bit more full-figured or mature. Well, it may be a very fat 15-year-old, but I think it's, that, that looks like it, it fits a full-grown woman, but it's, it's quite beautiful. I brought it home, it had been sitting outside at a shop and it was filthy. And Linda, my girlfriend, took it into the cleaners to have it done. And the, there was a woman working there who was from Afghanistan. And she looked at it and she started crying because it reminded her of her home. I used to take great pride that I, was, uh, I would be able to take one major trip and one minor trip a year. I, when I got up to about 14-week a year vacation schedule, I decided to stop working so hard and concentrate more on traveling. I like Africa. I'd like to go to the Congo. But Congo is expensive and is dangerous. South America is the undiscovered continent. In terms of natural beauty, geographic variety, culture, it's got everything that Europe has. It's a lot closer and a whole lot cheaper. Peru is one of the places you can go to and speak English. Uh, People are put off for South America because there's not a lot of English speakers around. You don't need to know a lot of Spanish, but a little bit is helpful. I haven't been to the big one, Brazil, but I was advised a few years ago. I met a girl from Brazil on a, traveling on a bus. She told me the secret. If you're American and you're an English speaker, people will speak Spanish to you and understand your Spanish. Uh, because they can, but they won't do it for South Americans. So I will go to Brazil. I went to Iraq last year, but when in terms of fear of travel, people, do, uh, people think about the unlikely, which is terrorist attacks or bombs or kidnapping, and they discount the more real and the more mundane. You're far more likely to die in a traffic accident than being a victim yeah, the risk of crime is real, but you're going to be robbed. You're not going to be killed. If you're staying in, in an iffy place, if you, stay, if you stay locally, you stay with a, uh, a family hotel or like, you're far gonna, no one's going to bother you. The family doesn't, who's running the hotel isn't going to let strangers in, rob your room or rob you. They're, they're, concer they're concerned about their business and their reputation, whereas if you, if you stay at an American-run hotel, if you get to get just... It's an enormous hassle just to get past the front door because all the security and the bomb checks and the like. And then, if they were going to attack you, that's where they would be because that's where all the bombings are. I have been pickpocketed three times. And you know why they pickpocket strangers, particularly in places like Africa? Because they kill 
pickpockets in the market. If someone gets caught stealing in the marketplace in Africa, you're going to be beaten to death immediately. They don't, they don't think much of thieves in Africa. Now, I was pickpocketed, ex or the most ex expertly pickpocketed in China, just yards from the, my hotel, where my camera with this big loopy strap disappeared from inside my bag with this stuff all piled on top of it without my knowing it and without my seeing it at, at the same time, without my seeing it, without anyone being near me. It was, a, it was, it was pure artistry and I lost, lo lost my camera there. So I don't worry about worrying about packing far in advance because I just take a few things, pretty much know what I'm going to need. I don't, uh, I, I bring an empty bag often so I, inside another for any acquisitions and purchases. Uh, sometimes I need food, sometimes you go into a dry country. I was without a, a week without my luggage in the Cape Verde Islands. And I had a change, uh, change of clothes with me in my little day, a little rucksack, and that's all I needed. It, it was very liberating not to not have me hauling a suitcase around. But as I get older and lazier on some of these trips, I don't mind taking lots and lots of stuff because other people will be handling my luggage for me. The, I'm creating employment. I've been stopped in Uzbekistan by the police and dragged to the headquarters and made, made me empty out my pockets when they see I didn't have hardly any money at all. They, uh, they let me go <laughs> without I didn't have to bribe them. I didn't have to pay a tax. But and in Kazakhstan, I got stopped a couple times by corrupt policemen. I assume they were corrupt. The, uh, a couple times I just pretended. Well, I, uh, actually, no, the first time was the one I, I uh, the guy want, who stopped me demanded my passport, wanted me to go with him. And it was just a local woman in the market comes up and starts berating the cops. Like, why are you bothering him? I could tell, even though I didn't understand, didn't understand a word of it. Why are you bothering and let him go? You should be ashamed of yourself. He's a tourist. Don't. And he, he just left me. Like, he, he just slunk, slank, slunk, slinked away <laughs> after that. And then a couple more times, I had the same number pulled on me. But this time, I'd wised up, and I just pretended to. I didn't understand him at all. And just kept going, like I shrugged my shoulder. And, just kept walking and they didn't, didn't bother me because apparently there's a limit to their brazenness. Well, I'd signed up for a trip to Iran. The trip was scheduled for September 2011 and it, it, it went off. In fact, it was a good trip because very few people showed up for it. <laughs> uh, the visa, I didn't get my visa approved until the day before departure. But when we arrived at Iran, which, by the way, is probably the most pro-American country in the world, uh, Iran, uh, America to them, represents prosperity and freedom, two things that they don't have but very much desire. So enormously friendly. And I was warned by the hotel, don't carry your passport with you. There are all sorts of scam artists posing as secret police. The police, the ordinary police, are not allowed to ask for uh, your passport, except it turns out the real secret police can ask for your passport. It was the day before the tour was supposed to start, and I had read about the def uh, exhibition of the defense of the sacred homeland uh, commemorating the Iran-Iraq war from 10 years before. And it was really, uh, what it really was, was a terrorism trade show, but it was real, quite interesting, and I was snapping away, and I took a picture of a display of how to assassinate people on a motorcycle, well, while you're uh, from, from a motorcycle, undetected. All of a sudden, people came up to me and dragged me away, you know, dragged me away, wanted to ask me who I was, and Hold, hold, and, and holding me and detaining me, and, and, and then other people came for me. And they, they didn't speak a lot of English, just a little bit, like, you know, no pictures, you're here. Oh, apparently they were in that particular display. I'd been taking pictures all day, un, unmolested. There was a big sign in Farsi that said no pictures allowed, uh, but not in English. They, they, they took me away. I mean, these guys were all armed. They, they were quite serious and kept asking me questions like, where's my passport? <laughs> And what I do here, but they didn't speak English. It was an interrogation room with bright lights, and they would ask me questions like, 
Iran, good, because <laughs> that's about all the English they knew. And finally, they get someone who speaks English on the phone who interviews me. Why am I taking pictures? What am I doing? So they took the film from my camera, because those still film days, told me that they were going to develop it, and I could have my pictures back later. And this was already hours ago and by. But I was worried because this was Thursday, late Thursday, at the beginning of their weekend, because Friday's the day off. And it was a long holiday weekend. I said, oh, no, I'm going to be in jail until all weekend long. And I'm going to miss my trip because we were leaving the next day. And after a few hours, they decided I was a good guy. And when they became, uh, they became very friendly at that point, and they decided to, and they're going to take the drive me back to my hotel, and it was a pretty cool ride because the car, it was a nice big German car, I think it was an, I think it was an Audi, and tra it was the weekend traffic beginning for Tehran, and the streets are clogged, as you can imagine, it's completely congested and clogged, and all of a sudden the guy gets on the microphone and starts shouting out, out of the way, out of the way, I assume, that's what he's saying, and putting on the lights, and it's like, the Red Sea parting, and everyone gets, gets out of the way, and they get me right back to the hotel. And I got back just in time at the, for the conclusion of the, uh, the group orientation meeting, warning about don't wander off on your own, don't go when you are dangerous, don't take any pictures, don't get, in, don't get into trouble. <laughs> but I missed that meeting. I asked him, oh, can I go back and get my film? And he said, no way, you are not going back there. I d do not like group travel. But there's some places you have to go in group travel simply because there is no other travel uh, there. When I went to the Soviet Union, group travel only. When I was one of the, early in China, long before I'd opened individual tourists, it was group travel only. Turkmenistan, North Korea, places like that, group travel. Other places, you don't have to have a group, but you have to have a guide at all times, uh, just like Tibet. Uh, example, or even even in the restricted areas of India, out there, there's many tribal areas of India that uh, Orissa State, Nagaland, Arunachal Pradesh, we, you must have a guide with you at all time. And there's my travel buddy from Vancouver who likes the same thing. I met him on a trip in 2000, and he likes the same thing. And once a year in December, we after spending most of the year arguing where we're, uh, where we're going to go, we, we go and we go to a place and we usually have a guide, usually arrange for a driver and a guide if, if, that's, if that's necessary. Uh, if it's not, we just do it on our own. But I like, I like doing things on my own. It gives me a sense of achievement. Uh, I'm not big on eating foods unless it's ex especially disgusting so I could tell stories about it not because I want to eat it, with the exception of Vietnam, where, is, where I want to go just for the food. But for instance, I remember was, uh, uh, one Christmas day, I was in, the, in Guatemala, in the north part, uh, having just visited Tikal. I thought I'd have my traditional Christmas dinner consisting of turtle and armadillo. I know I've never eaten dog. Because every time I want to go, dog is a, in, in Asia is a delicacy. They don't sell it all over the place. And I never could get anyone to go in with me on it because you just can't order a little, uh, a, a, a little skewer or, or a dog kebab. You have to buy the whole pooch. <laughs> <laughs> I like interesting. I like exotic. I like difference. For instance, I'm thinking of play one spot in was it Indonesia. Just came, we just came across a funeral. And there were, uh, it was really good the way, just just the way they conduct things, or weddings and interesting and exotic. There's no one thing, but I guess I'll get bored sitting around just looking at scenery. I want to keep moving. I've already decided I have no soul because I decided the experience was going to be in Benares or Varanasi on the Ganges at dawn in the boat with the good Santanums and it's supposed to be the most holy experience of all and I went out there and said, oh, it was good and I took some nice pictures and like that but since nothing happened to me and I didn't feel anything other than this is pretty cool, I said, I decided I have no soul. Uh, we're going to uh, an actual reprise. We're going back to Nagaland. There's a festival there. The Nagas are tribal people completely un uh, 
unlike what you think of as, as India. It's geographically remote. It's right on the border with Burma. And they were headhunters until quite recently. Uh, cannibalism is outlawed and no more skull taking. But the souvenirs are still, are, are still there. And they have a festival from the different tribes. It's a 10-day festival. It's up by the Chinese border. It's a restricted area. And it's even more primitive. So that is the next trip. And I wouldn't have gone to Afghanistan this year so close to having been in northern Pakistan and uh, Iraq. But I saw the window was closing. I think it's going to be a one huge no-go area after the uh, NATO forces leave. Uh, the south part of the country is completely off limits already. You would, uh, uh, there you would get kidnapped if you, uh, or killed. If you, want, if you want there simply because you're uh, you're a foreigner. Beach, beaches and resorts to me are are boring, and I, I said if I wanted to do, start doing beaches, I could get, I'd get a lot more countries a whole lot sooner. Cause just go to the Caribbean. I've been to a couple Caribbean islands and pretty much skipped the beach. But the more exotic the trip, the more interesting the people. There were some interesting people I've met uh, on this Iraq trip that I'll keep in touch with. Uh, there's people I've met in some of the other really exotic trips. I mean, off, off, beaten, off that I've keep in, in sporadic contract with. But yeah, the uh, if you want us kindred souls, sign up for North Korea or Turkmenistan or Iraq or Afghanistan. You'll find people you have something in common with. I'll tell you what something in common with. In the small pond here of Jacksonville, I'm a big fish in the travel department because I've been more than more places than everyone else. But when I go on those trips, I get outclassed by people who've been to a lot more places than I have. For instance, I met a guy, uh, I think he had already mushed to the North Pole and was working on the South Pole. But unfortunately, in my old age, I'm getting more infirm and softer. <laughs> I, 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 I've become less, l less able to spend 18 hours in, 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 in a coach airline seat which, are, by the way, are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It's not just me. They really are getting smaller and, uh, and, and less able to deal with it or willing to deal with, with, with hostels <laughs> and, and, and the like. So I got a little bit, but luckily I'm fortunate enough to be able to indulge myself a little bit more. So when do I so so I want to I, I, I want to get a lot of the rugged travel out of the way while I still can, while, while, while I'm still up to it. Hi, I'm Ron, and I am the world's foremost authority. Just ask. <laughs> he was the smartest guy at school. Ron is a unique person. If I would put it that way, the psychic said, "How are you doing?" And Ron looked at her and he said, "I thought you'd tell us." Yeah.